in the chapter I have here on the, the legality of the drone strikes that this is against international law and it's against U.S. law. But what about the killing of Americans with drones overseas? I mean, didn't you think that Americans by the Constitution have the right to some kind of judicial process? I see a lot of heads shaking yes. Well, I think that most Americans thought that was the case until the Attorney General told these law students that that's not the case. That it turns out that American citizens are not guaranteed judicial process, but they are only guaranteed something vaguely called due process. Uh, and it seems like this can be done on Terror Tuesdays in the White House by the President and some of his advisors. So this might all work, in quotes, for the US government if the US were the only country that had drones. But this is not the case. It's not like nuclear technology that is so complicated. Uh, it's a actually a simple technology that can be replicated and can also be bought on the open market. So the US right now, even though we manufacture very little in this country anymore, we still manufacture a lot of weapons and we are the number one manufacturer of drones. In fact, in Southern California is the hub of a lot of the drone manufacturing. But number two in production as well as in use is Israel. Uh, Israel and the United States have long had a collaboration on drones. In fact, the drones that are the lethal ones came from an engineer who worked in the Israeli military and moved to the United States to start a company that would then sell these to the Pentagon. The Israelis have used the drones during the invasion of Gaza in 2008-2009 when of the 1,400 people who were killed, over 800 of them were killed with drones. And drones are continued, uh, continually used in Ga Gaza by the Israeli military. In fact, it's used as a selling point by the military when it tries to sell these drones overseas to say this has been battle tested time and time again. Uh, again, of course, the, the guinea pigs are the Palestinian people. So the Israelis are number one when it comes to the sale of drones overseas. They sell 85% of the drones to 50 different countries. Now they say these are surveillance drones, but so were the lethal drones surveillance drones until somebody strapped some weapons onto them. They can be easily converted from surveillance to weaponized drones. The number three producer is China. China recognizes a growth market when it sees one and is now producing dozens of different kinds of drones. So what do you think other countries who now have these drones are thinking? Um, why shouldn't China say, ah, we have been fighting those Tibetan terrorists for so long, now we're going to go to the United States where some of them are living and just drop a Hellfire missile and kill them? Or oh, why shouldn't the Russians kill the Chechens who are living overseas? Or oh, why shouldn't the Cubans say, aha, those known terrorists who've been living in Miami for so long, we ought to send in a missile there and drop it on their condominium. And if we kill a couple of neighbors in the process, well, you know, oops, that's what happens. Or the Iranians who downed one of the US spy drones, they said they hacked into the system and they showed it for all the world to see, to say, look at this beautiful spy drone that we now have. Thank you very much, uh, President Obama, for this gift. And lo and behold, a couple of months later, they reverse engineered it and now have this very sophisticated spy drone. Why shouldn't they be spying, be using it to spy over the United States? Well, we know the answer to those questions and that's until now because the US is so powerful, other countries don't dare to do it. But how long is that going to last? As I say in the book, what goes around comes around. And it's not just what might come back at us from drones that other countries or other groups um, might be dropping on people in the United States. There is the issue of drones in the United States um, by our own government. So let's talk for a minute about drones here in the US because it's really fascinating. Raise your hand if you think there's already a lot of drones being used in the United States. Raise your hand if you don't think there's a lot of drones being used. Okay, you la the latter group was correct. And that is because the regulation of our airspace is being done by the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, and their mandate is to keep our airspace safe. 
Well, they know something that the general public doesn't know, and that is these drones crash all the time. In fact, the Air Force has admitted that a third of the drones crash, and the CIA doesn't admit anything, so we don't know how many of their drones crash, but we can assume that it's a lot. And we even know that the, the very big drone, I mentioned uh, the Global Hawk, the size of a commercial airplane, crashed just about a couple of weeks ago in Maryland, and luckily it crashed in a swamp, but it could have easily crashed above a residential area and killed a lot of people. So the FAA has been reluctant to give out a lot of permits, but it's also been reluctant to tell us how many permits it's been giving out, and it took the group called the Electronic Frontier Foundation to sue the FAA to start getting some of this information out. Some of the permits, and there are only about 300 permits right now that uh, agencies in the U.S. have. Some of them are government agencies like the FBI, Homeland Security, the Border Patrol is using them on the southern and the northern borders. Um, some of them are companies that are testing out the drones. Some of them are universities, state universities that are working with the military on this drone program. And a handful of them are police departments. Well, the drone manufacturers have a problem with the slow pace that the permits are being given out with in the United States. And so what do they do? They form their own lobby. And of course, what does a very good lobby in the United States do? It buys Congress people. And so they have done what the American way is. They've bought their Congress people, and they now have their own drone caucus in Congress made up of 58 members of Congress, mostly Republicans, but Democrats are in there too, including some self-described liberal Democrats. And they, uh, according to their mandate, they are addressing the urgent need to have more drones being used overseas and at home, both for commercial and law enforcement purposes. And so together with the drone industry and the drone caucus, they wrote a new piece of legislation that was signed by President Obama, in fact, on Valentine's Day of this year, a great big Valentine's present for the drone industry, and it says the FAA must open up the U.S. airspace totally to drones by the end of September 2015 and for law enforcement before that. Well, I mentioned that there are some police departments that are experimenting with drones. The, uh, the drone lobby would like to see every police department, and there's about 18,000 of them, would like to see everyone have their own fleet of drones. Well, the problem is not only the permit so far, but the problem is also money, because police departments, like every other department in most places, are broke. They're cutting pensions, they're cutting salaries, uh, and so where are they going to get money to buy drones? The federal government, that's right. And so here comes Homeland Security to the rescue, and the Justice Department as well, to say we will give you grants to experiment with these drones. So it's like a drug pusher coming and say, you know, here little girl, wouldn't you like to try this? Getting them hooked on drones and getting the other police departments around them to say, hey, you know, we want drones as well. So uh, I talk a little bit in, in the book about this new phenomena of drones coming home. And I wanted to quote the CEO of a company that sold drones to a police department right outside of Houston. And he said at a press conference that these drones were designed for the police departments to use for surveillance purposes, but they actually were also designed to be weaponized. And they could in the future be outfitted with what we call less lethal systems like tasers that can electrocute suspects on the ground, beanbag firing guns uh, called stun batons. They can also have hand grenades. They can also have 12-gauge uh, shotguns. Um, but uh, they said, rest assured, said the sheriff in this press conference. He said, no matter what we do in law enforcement, somebody's going to question it. But we're going to do the right thing, and I can assure you of that. So I don't know, are you feeling reassured? So either is the ACLU and other civil libertarians who are saying that everything is in place right now 
for a 24-7 surveillance society, and that if our police departments indeed get their hands on drones, um, they can use them to uh, spy on Muslim community, black community, who else might they want to spy on? Code Pink, <laughs> the peace community, environmental activists, you name it. Um, we already know that many of these groups have been infiltrated by the FBI, so why shouldn't they be spied on by drones? Um, it's very interesting, though, because this threat of drones coming home to spy on it us is something that has sparked a real response in the United States. And so we gathered together a couple of hundred people in Washington, D.C. at the end of April to talk about what can we do about this. So first, in terms of things that we can do overseas, we talked about a campaign that would step up the kind of visible protests in front of Air Force bases around this country, and we've identified many dozens of Air Force bases and are trying to get communities like the Code Pink groups, Catholic worker groups, uh, and people who were so active during the Bush administration to protest in front of the military bases, protest at the sites of the drone manufacturers, uh, and uh, other uh, offices that are involved in the production and the use of drones. We were also told by some of the lawyers at the drone conference that one of the best things to do would be to focus on the CIA's uh, drones because that is so patently illegal that there can be justification to say that the military should have drones as part of its arsenal, and yes, they should be regulated, but why should the CIA have drones? The CIA is not a military organization. It's a civilian organization, and according to international law, when a civilian organization like the CIA is engaged in militant activity, they, they should be considered unlawful combatants. You've heard that term? used about the Taliban. Well, that's what international law says about the CIA as well as private contractors who are involved in the lethal use of drones. And the other thing about the CIA is that it has no accountability. I mean, they can kill wherever and whenever they want and there is nothing in place to get the wheels turning to find out what happened. And so we have been focusing on Dianne Feinstein as the senator in California who is the head on the Senate of the Intelligence Committee. And we're going to pass around a sign-up sheet now. Uh, we will be taking these to her office. We went and met with her office th last week in California, and now we're going to meet with her in Washington, D.C. So please sign on to this so that we can show that there are thousands of her constituents that are feeling that Dianne Feinstein is not doing her job, that, that she should um, make sure that our government is respecting in international law, and part of what she can do is take drones out of the hands of the CIA. Another thing that we want to do is to take a peace delegation to Pakistan, and for the first time, this would be uh, people coming from the United States to work together with groups and individuals in Pakistan to try to do a march to the, the areas in northern Pakistan where the drone strikes are killing so many innocent people. This is a quote from the foreign minister of, of Pakistan when asked about why do three quarters of, of Pakistanis uh, think of the United States as an enemy country and one word answer. Um, although we did not see the protests in Pakistan, these happen frequently, protests against the United States, uh, uh, burning the flags, and, and uh, uh, it is a dangerous place for, for Americans. But um, we did absolutely feel that they could understand the difference between Americans who were visiting and American policies, and, and I can't really stress that enough. Um, there are a lot of tenets of, of international law that the drones program violate. The United Nations Charter that says that you will not attack another country, another sovereign nation, respecting sovereign borders. The Geneva Conventions that talk about how you treat people, <coughs> escalation of violence and proportionality, uh, giving fair warning, uh, capt capturing people and caring for them, uh, treating uh, injured people. 
Um, that, uh, the drones program violates many, many tenets of the Geneva Conventions. And of course, the U.S. Constitution that says that uh, the president has to have uh, approval of Congress before he attacks another country militarily. So the, the basic precept of sovereignty is something that I think everybody can understand. Uh, and and we, Kareem Khan, one of the gentlemen from the tribal areas we talked to in, in depth, we talked about all the time, he said, but we are Pakistanis and you are not at war with Pakistan, so how can you attack us? Um, it is a sp particularly a problem in Pakistan, the drones program, because it is controlled by the CIA. Uh, our drones from, and that we launch against other countries, Afghanistan and Yemen, are, are operated by uh, the military. And at least there is a, a bit of a check and balance with the military. But with the CIA, it's completely uh, covert. Uh, at their, even their, their funding, of course, is classified. We don't know how much money is being spent on drones. And there's nobody to hold accountable. Um, the drones program does not allow the accused, so to speak, to have any evidence or charges brought against them. We just assassinate them. Uh, so it's, there's, no, there's no way to positively identify people before they are attacked. Um, they're given no chance to surrender. Um, another thing that is really particularly disturbing to us is this targeting of first responders. Uh, what they do is uh, uh, when the CIA identifies some uh, supposed target, somebody they're going to take out, um, they send in a missile, a Hellfire missile, and explodes. And then um, uh, people, the family members and the neighbors will come to see if they can help. And, and perhaps maybe somebody has survived and they can take them to the medical care. But then shortly after that first attack, a second missile will come in and attack the people who are going to respond. So now people are very, very afraid. Even medical <coughs> professionals are afraid to come in and try to see if anybody is still alive and try to respond. And this is a flagrant violation of international law. So what we have here, it's hard to read, it's in red, but ex th what this, the drones program is are extrajudicial assassinations. We are murdering people uh, outside all, all nor known norms of, of law. Targeting, um, at least Bush, uh, as heinous as he was, um, he, he considered his strikes surgical. He had names of people. He was going after particular people. Uh, but the Obama administration started doing something called signature strikes, where if the, uh, the target uh, fits his criteria, and that would be uh, any military-aged man, uh, if you're old enough to grow facial hair and you're male, you, you could be considered a militant. Mm -hmm. And in fact, these two gentlemen here are victims, but they would be considered militants because uh, that's how the, the Obama administration can you know, if, if you're if you're a military age male, you are considered uh, a militant. Um, the uh, you also, the other way we ask about how do how does the CIA know where to target? How do they get their information? Because we don't have any military troops on the ground, so they're getting their information through informants, people who are being paid by the uh, 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 Pakistani intelligence, the ISI. And sometimes the uh, Pakistani, uh, the, the, the Pashtuns people who live in the region are paid to place what they call chips. And I don't actually know what it looks like, but they call them chips. And I suppose there's something like a, a little uh, type of GPS device. And they are placed uh, in the home or the car or the vehicle or something of somebody that they don't like or somebody that they're, the, the CIA wants to take out. So uh, these GPS chips uh, identify uh, the supposed militants. Um, the one thing that Kareem mentioned several times is that uh, when, when the U.S. government claims uh, after a strike has happened that, oh, we got the number two guy, we got this guy, and occasionally they will actually name a name of we got this fellow here and he was a you know, high-level al-Qaeda operative. And then three weeks later, we kill the same person. And then, uh, you know, another month later, the same person. So Kareem said, we wonder how many lives can one man have? How is it that you can keep killing the same people over and over again? Well, the United States and, and uh, Pakistan cannot, um, uh, I guess they feel like eventually they have to name names. They can't just say militants were killed, militants were killed. But in fact, um, I think both American and Pakistani populations are willing to believe that these things are very precise and only kill bad people. And um, I'm afraid that, that neither 
population has really been uh, inquisitive enough and pushy enough to find out, well, who are these people? What are their names? What are their genders? What are their ages? Uh, and we were told that in Pakistan, it's very, uh, very, un very common, I guess, to, to see just some kind of vague report of a drone strike happened and militants were killed without the names. Just like here, we don't, we don't hear about that. So what is a militant? You know, we, we hear all these terms used almost interchangeably, synonymously, a militant. Um, but you know, even if, <laughs> you know, the reports that we saw that, that talked about so many deaths and so many of those were civilians or non-combatants, but in fact, <coughs> All of those people were innocent civilians because none of them had been taken to, uh, through a judicial process. And none of them were wearing the uniform of their country. So what is a militant? You know, if, if I dare say that if, uh, if there were another country had drones flying around the United States and they were targeting people that they thought were plotting against them uh, and we, we fought back, uh, we would all be militants. Uh, so language is very important. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, this is a, a quote from Glenn, um, he compiled these headlines and, you know, the American media is really complicit in perpetuating this idea that we are only killing bad people. Uh, and then this, this idea is pervasive. It's repeated over and over again. And um, people say, well, yes, sometimes there is collateral damage. There are some civilians killed. But we, what choice do we have? Uh, we, it's really important. This is the most precise weapon we have. And we're killing uh, militants, the bad guys. I want to talk a little bit about um, Ambassador Hoagland. Actually, he was uh, the acting ambassador. He replaced um, the uh, Pakistani am uh, ambassador to Pakistan, who was replaced because he said some things that weren't exactly in keeping with the Obama administration's party line. So he was replaced by this gentleman, uh, Richard, call me Dick Hoagland. <laughs> and um, he, he invited us to call him Dick, and we did. Um, <laughs> So he, uh, <laughs> this is a picture uh, of uh, uh, the first meeting that he had with us at the, at the hotel where we were staying. And Medea Benjamin there, the woman standing, is presenting him with a book, a copy of her book, Drone Warfare. And then seated is uh, a former diplomat and retired Army Colonel Ann Wright. Uh, so he came to our hotel to brief us on uh, security and, and to tell us, warn us basically, that it was very, very dangerous and that uh, he said, I'm not going to try to talk you out of it. I know your mind's made up, but so I'm basically here to listen. Um, and so we did, uh, we did talk to him about several things. So the, the question I asked him, um, I said, so Am Ambassador, um, since you know exactly where we plan to go, we've advertised it widely, our exact route, um, I assume that you have passed that information on to the CIA and the, and the Department of Defense, and they know exactly where we're going to be. So can we assume that there will be no drone attacks on this route? And he kind of chuckled, and he said, yes, I can guarantee you that you will not be targeted uh, on, this, on this trip. And I said, well, that's what I thought. So if that is so, uh, then could we not just place American citizens all throughout Waziristan <laughs> and let you know where we are so that we can protect the lives of these, the people in this region? And, and he told me that he kind of, he didn't answer that particular point, but he said, he said that the, this area, Waziristan, was being overrun by foreigners, he said. He didn't say what country they were from, but that, uh, well, I, I, he said that they were, they were uh, foreigners came in and they took over and that the people that lived in this area would be more than happy to have these people taken out and uh, uh, that it would be, they would be happy. We challenged him on the, we asked him about uh, civilian casualties. Um, we had read the, the Stanford uh, NYU report that said 3,300 people had been killed. We asked him what he thought the number was and he said he believed it was nearly zero. He agreed with President Obama that it was virtually no civilian uh, casualties. And, and um, he said just that morning he had gone to look at some classified intelligence and he wanted us to know that he was letting us in on a kind of a secret. <laughs> and he said, uh, I can tell you, I can't tell you the exact number, but I can tell you that it's in the two digits. And I believe it was Ann Wright said, well, is that 10 or is that 99? Uh, which, which end? And he said, oh, well, I've, I've really said too much. I can't tell you. I've, I've said too much. I'm probably going to get in trouble for that. So we know it's in the four digits. And, uh, oh, and Probably even more than that. We don't know exactly how many, but he denied that it was anywhere near what we know it to be. 
We asked him about the double tap, the, 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 sec the strikes on the first responders. He denied that that happened. We talked about compensation. He was a little bit amenable to the idea that, that people who uh, had homes were damaged or, or family members were killed should receive compensation just as they do in Afghanistan. But he said, but we have no vehicle for doing that. There is no mechanism to give people uh, compensation. Um, and then we, we talked about the Stanford report. So this was the first meeting, and he did listen a good bit. And then uh, just before we left to go to Waziristan, we got word from the embassy that there was highly credible intelligence that, um, that there were going to be animals that, uh, with explosives strapped to the animal that would be put into this area that we were planning on going to for the march and that we were warned that we should not go and, and trying to frighten us that, that it was going to be very, very dangerous. Um, then after we returned, we had a second meeting with him at his residence. And, you know, I think uh, well, Joe was there. Uh, there were, I don't know, six or, six or so of us. And I thought he would ask us lots of questions about what we had seen and who we had talked to. Uh, he took no notes, not one. Uh, he, uh, we asked him, had he read the Stanford report by now? No, he said, I haven't read it. I, I understand it's controversial, um, and that uh, I, 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 you know, he'd read a synopsis of it. Well, it is controversial because it doesn't match what the Obama administration is putting out. Um, he has not met with any of the victims, and there's no, uh, there's no uh, way for victims to go to the embassy to be heard. Uh, he's not interested in meeting uh, any of them. Um, I asked him specifically about the international <coughs> law. I kept talking about, you know, this, this drones program is a violation of international law. And he said, well, you may believe that. And I said, no, it's not a matter of belief. I mean, it's, it's law. Uh, and I was just incredulous that this man was so uh, in denial uh, and not willing to admit that uh, laws of sovereignty and, and, and targeting first responders, um, that, that you know, I, this is a career diplomat. This isn't just some appointed person that's sitting in a cushy dip diplomatic job. The man's been a diplomat for years and years and years. He denied, uh, oh, I said, uh, well, would you at least concede that the presence of these drones overhead 24 hours a day, uh, buzzing overhead, and, and, and the, the, the residents knowing that they're there, that this is a type of psychological warfare. Uh, this is a type of mental torture. Would you not agree that? And he said, well, from what I understand, they fly so high they can neither be seen nor heard. You know, and we had first-hand accounts that, that he could easily have known about had he read the Stanford report or had he interviewed any of the people that live in the area. Um, he denied that our photos were real. He said that they were made up or they were created by intelligence, and he was just really indifferent. And what appalled me the most is knowing what we know that, that the, um, the, the foreign minister said drones. This is the number one problem between the two countries. Mm -hmm. He is the president's representative. You would think that this would be something that he would take a great deal of interest in. Um, these are exact quotes from um, Ambassador Hoagland about the, 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 first, uh, the uh, first responder, the, the double tap. Uh, and the operative word there are legitimate first responders. We said, well, what's a legitimate first responder? He said, well, you know, like a, an ambulance with a Red Crescent ambulance. <laughs> well, this is a very rural area. There are, uh, you know, barely roads, much less there are no, there are no uh, Red Crescent ambulances. Um, we do not target compounds when there are women and children visible. Well, most of the drone strikes happen at night when people are sleeping. So the children are in bed and the women are, are inside. Uh, and then this was the last thing. Uh, Anne Wright especially had, uh, in our pr prior meetings and, and meeting with think tanks and, and academic institutions and stuff, she had talked about Obama's kill list and on Tuesday he goes over this list and, and, and it's, well, it's well documented. This was reported and, and, and uh, he said this is what upset him, that we would talk about a kill list and th that's what was offensive to him. And he was very upset that we were perpetuating this idea that President Obama was deciding who shall live and who shall die. Thank you.